figures this week. Christina, over to you. So, hi everyone. This is going to be very, very brief, much shorter than normal, so we have plenty of time um, to hear from Professor Gupta. So I'm just going to cover cases, vaccination update, a very brief update on variants, and just a few slides on Bolton in particular. So, overall with cases, um, this is just people who've had a positive test every day in the UK. Everything is pretty flat. Over the last month, if we if we zoom in, we can see that there was a big drop um, in daily cases over the Easter holidays. But since kind of the middle of April, things have been pretty flat with perhaps, you know, tiny increase over the last few days. If we look at it by home nation, you can see everything's flat except Scotland. And the cases in Scotland have started going up um, since the beginning of May. Um, and this is also kind of reflected in the ONS infection survey, which came out today, except that they say that England's slightly going up and in Scotland, they, it isn't yet in the ONS survey. And I think this is because it's very regional. So if we look at um, positivity rate, just in English local authorities, which is um, the proportion of positive tests out of all tests, you can see that for most places, the orange ones, which is this week, are kind of in the middle of the gray ones, which is the previous week. And that just shows you that overall everything's flat. But then there are these outliers. So Bolton is here at the top now with a 7.5% positivity rate, which is much, much higher than anywhere else. Blackburn is there as well. And then Bedford and Kirklees. And certainly for at least three of those local authorities, we know that the, the new variant of concern, B1617.2, is dominant in those areas. In Scotland, you're seeing something similar where, again, their cases and their positivity rates is really dominated by Glasgow and East Renfrewshire, which is just to the, um, the southwest of Glasgow. So again, it's very kind of located there and they, they believe that in Glasgow, it's also driven by this new variant. Looking at um, vaccination, this is just the percentage of adults with one and two doses for each nation as of yesterday. So for second doses, it's, it's almost 40% of adults across all the nations. For first doses, it's now 70% everywhere except Wales, which is higher. They're at over 80% and then are vaccinating a slightly younger age group um, than the other home nations are a bit ahead. If we look at the age groups, this is first day's coverage by age. Um, and you can see I've highlighted kind of a slightly darker color, the age groups that we're currently doing, and this is England. So we're currently kind of trying to finish off the 40 to 50 year olds. We're not quite at the levels we are at for the other age groups, but we're getting there. And we have just started with the under 40s. If we're looking at um, second doses, we are kind of trying to, to do people between 55 and 70 right now. We've almost finished the, the kind of 65 and above, but we're still not quite at the level we wanna be. But these are kind of the age groups that we're currently doing for second doses. So variants, um, the UK COVID genomics consortium called COG UK sequence um, positive cases in the UK. So what that means is they try and determine which variant it is. They sequence about half of all community cases now, and they sequence all positive cases and incoming travelers to the UK and also from surge testing. And then the Wellcome Sanger Institute take that data and they try and they remove traveler cases and surge testing cases. So what they're trying to do is have a look at what the distribution of variances are kind of in, in the community in England. And their latest data goes to the 8th of May. And this chart kind of shows you the proportion of sequence cases for variants as a proportion of all cases. And what you can see is that this blue patch is our dominant variant, B117, which is commonly known as the Kent variant. And this red one is B1617.2, which is kind of one of the so-called Indian variants. And you can see that really since the beginning of April, this has rapidly come to be quite a significant proportion of all cases now. It's almost 30% to the 8th of May. And these kind of tiny little colors here are all the other variants, which really just haven't gotten a foothold yet and hopefully never will. And I just wanted to kind of explain a little bit about why you can have 
concern about this growing variant and yet still see overall numbers declining because often it kind of feels like well why are we worried when overall numbers are declining and this is just the absolute number of sequence cases um, by the Sanger Institute and this is again B117 this is the big drop over Easter but you can see that this is kind of a declining pandemic right we're, we're the Kent variant is going down in numbers and this is now the rapid growth of the new variant so on this scale, you can't really see it, but these numbers are doubling every week. But what it means is that when you add them up and look at overall numbers, things still look flat or going down slightly. But what happens is that because the dominant variant is going down, but it's still bigger in absolute numbers, it masks the increase in the new variant. And you're not going to see an impact in overall numbers until this kind of overtakes this, which in England, if growth, carry, if growth carries on as it is, and that's a question, um, will probably be in the next few weeks. So that kind of explains why you can be really worried about this rapid growth and you actually not see anything, in fact, see a decline in overall numbers. So finally, just a quick look at Bolton, which is the area with the highest case rates in England right now. This is cases per day in Bolton over the last um, six weeks. You can see there's been this rapid increase there's also been a rapid increase in testing, particularly over the last couple of weeks. That's they're trying to surge test and find all the cases that they have. Um, positivity rates are high. They're not going up anymore. So it looks like you know, they are testing now and finding a lot of cases, but it's not that there's a big pool of um, unfound cases. And this kind of just shows you the age groups in Bolton. So the, the redder it is, the higher the case rates. And these are age groups from 0 to 4 up to 60 and over, and the highest rates um, are in 10 to 14 year olds at 740 cases per 100,000 per week. And so the average case rate across the whole of England is about 20 per 100,000 um, per week. So you can kind of see how much bigger that is. And then the next highest are in 5 to 9 year olds and 15 to 19 year olds. And you can see that cases in this kind of school age children started increasing the earliest out of all of these age ranges. But the over 50s have really not seen that big an increase, which is really good. And hopefully, at least in large part, due to vaccination. But even there, you are now seeing it starting to creep in with case rates now double what they were um, a couple of weeks ago there. And what is a bit concerning about Bolton is that case rates for school aged children, the 740 per 100,000, is much higher than they've ever been throughout the pandemic. It's higher than they were in November and higher than they were in December and January. Now, part of that will be surge testing, but it's unlikely to be all surge testing because um, not, that's not true for the other age groups and cases are now creeping into even the older age groups. And this is just a, a chart very quickly to show you. This is age um, vaccination by age in Bolton. First dose is blue, second dose is orange and the lines are average, the England average. There's no difference. It's not that Bolton is less vaccinated. It isn't. Right. So so it, so trying to say oh, it was because there's less vaccination uptake just isn't true. So just to summarize, <coughs> cases have started to rise very slightly overall, but it's driven really only by a very few areas right now in, in Scotland and England. Vaccination is still going very well, um, which is very good news and it's increasing. So that's good. Um, but nonetheless, there is a rapid increase of this new variant. Um, currently, it's, it's confined to quite specific locations, um, but it is spreading across England. Um, and Bolton is experiencing a rapid increase in cases. And again, that's concentrated in the younger ages, but particularly in school age children. And I will stop there. Thank you very much for that rapid uh, survey of all those latest facts and figures there, Christina. And I'm now going to hand over to Professor Dean and Pille for a proper introduction to our special guest today, Professor Gupta. And then we'll be opening up to questions from the press and public. Over to you first, Dean. And thanks, Alice. It's a pleasure to um, to welcome Ravi, and thanks to him for spending uh, pu putting some time aside to join us to help us understand what all this is going on, uh, uh, everything that's uh, that, that's that's talked about variants, what does it all mean, really? Um, Ravi is uh, ideally placed to help us through this. He is both an infectious diseases doctor and also a scientist, and has actually spent the last 10, 15 years working on HIV 
in particular how HIV, another virus that is world that has a global spread, how that escapes drug treatment, how mutations develop, what they mean um, um, for how the virus replicates and so on. And so um, he's been ideally placed to now really push ahead very rapidly with understanding the same sort of um, uh, um, uh, issues with regard to um, SARS-CoV-2, the virus um, causing COVID-19. So, um, um, Ravi, thank you for joining us. Um, and we'll start by Christina and myself, you know, um, asking some questions of Ravi, getting the discussion going, that hopefully will both be informative, but will also um, uh, follow on, lead to a follow-on set of questions from the press and public. So I'll pass over to Christina, to, um, to start the discussion. Yeah, so I wanna start just as somebody who has no expertise in virology, but kind of can you just explain like what a variant of COVID actually is? So yeah, the, the, the term variant is, is um, an interesting one. I'm not sure that we've really used it much in virology and Dean and connect, connect, connect can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a term that we had, we, we developed really because we were seeing mutated forms of the virus that were that had significant numbers of mutations relative the, to the next nearest virus as it were and it happened kind of uh, uh, undetected and came from nowhere as it were so a, a variant really in its truest sense might just be a something a, a virus for example that that differs from another virus by just one single change is probably enough to call it something a variant because it's you know it's just different to something uh, related to it so that's the sort of true sort of meaning, but of course that doesn't mean much uh, globally, and it doesn't mean much in terms of you know vaccine responses or pathogenesis necessarily. Just to have one small change, although single changes can make quite big differences. Um, so variants have now been sort of used, the term variants has been used for viruses that have significant differences from uh, the, the the viruses around it, um, and usually as we've seen, it's associated with some kind of phenotypic or behavioural change in the virus. Can you just explain what you mean by pheno phenotypical behaviour? Uh, so phenotypic, so I, I qualified it by saying behavioural, but yes, yeah, so, so what phenotypic means is that uh, when, a, when, a, when the genetic code changes in, in a pathogen like SARS, uh, we need to know, we want to understand what the implication is and, and how does it affect the virus's um, behavior in infectivity or infection of someone, how readily it transmits or how ill you get. And so th those are all phenotypic qualities. So that, that's just the way the virus is behaving in individuals or in people. Okay. So, so th thanks, Ravi. Uh, and but mindful, we have a number of behavioural scientists here. So, what 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 we're saying is this is about really what the virus does when it gets into the body, when it gets into the cell, how it damages things. Um, so, I, th I think that that's that 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 that's clear. So, thanks for that. So, uh, if I can just follow on, um, you as well as many others have been talking um, uh, and, and doing research and presenting that research, writing papers and, um, and, and talking to the media about what the impact of these different variants are, trying to dissect the specifics, you know, about one variant versus another, one, one, one set of mutations to another. Can you help, um, uh, help us and help the audience here understand what are the different ways in which we can try and sort of try and assess what the actual impact of a variant is going to be on disease in the population? Okay, so uh, you can look at this on different levels, of course. You can, you can study populations and so we can start there. Um, so you need obviously a, a system where you can identify which viruses are causing which infections. And that's why there's the surveillance that uh, uh, is, is happening in this country is so important. So, uh, the, the, so COG UK's infrastructure means that a certain proportion of all infections can be sequenced uh, in terms of understanding the genetic code. And, and with that information, you know which variant you're dealing with. Um, and then you need the information from individuals. So you need some clinical data or uh, a, a data collected um, uh, at mass scale. Uh, and then to, so to then understand how that virus is behaving in in, in the population 
we've often used comparators. So we've used, you know, whatever went before. So when uh, the, the when the B117 came along, we were comparing it to uh, what we call the Wuhan 1 virus, which was the original virus, which had already um, developed an another variant, actually, uh, the D614G variant uh, that had swept the world. And that was the new kind of baseline or the comparator. So when, when B117 emerged, we compared its behavior with uh, this Wuhan D614G virus. And it was observed, uh, certainly in fact, that the way that the virus was identified was that uh, a, a surge or a big growth in infections was noted in the Southeast of, of England. Uh, 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 and it was much greater than surrounding areas. So that triggered a public health investigation and then the virus was identified. There was, no, you know, the, the, these the cluster of the, the B117 variant was identified. So that's it. so we came to understanding the, the behavior of a variant by studying an outbreak in that situation. In other situations, you may be trying to look at how different um, uh, variants are behaving in a population or operating in a population or, or causing infection. Is one taking over the other? Is is one becoming more common in the sequencing data than another one? And of course, you have to be very careful when you interpret those data because it could be regional. There could be other reasons why um, you see differences in proportions over time. So, and, and the other key to this is, of course, combining different data sets to get to the truth of what's really going on. So we've combined se the, uh, sequencing data along with testing data, interestingly, uh, something called the, the S-gene dropout, which people may have heard of, is, is actually a byproduct of, of, of PCR testing or testing from the nose and throat for how much, you know, what kind of, whether the material of the virus is in your nose uh, as to whether you get a positive or negative test. And that test in itself requires targeting of parts of the virus. And we noted that um, uh, that test was coming up with rather strange results uh, towards, the end of towards the end of last year uh, from September onwards. We were finding that a number of individuals were um, kind of ticking two out of three of the, the target boxes in the, in the test. And, and although the test was still positive, it was still strange and different from what happened before. And, and that was the first signal really of the B117 variant because that variant had a mutation uh, that uh, knocked out one of those targets. And so you only got two out of three targets coming up positive. So that was another way of tracking how common that variant was in the population. So that's a little description. I mean, that's a vignette of sort of uh, how we we understand what the variants are doing in the population. Now, do you want me to discuss the in vitro stuff? Well, we'll... Let, let, I think we'll come on to um, to the laboratory sort of things um, with regard to I immune escape and so forth. But Christina, do you want to follow yeah, on the question? So, I mean, you know, you were describing how with, with the Ken variant, we had outbreaks to study. And with, with the new variant, um, the B1617.2, which was first sequenced in India, you know, it seems like we don't have that much like detailed outbreak data. So how how are we trying to understand what it does and you know and how long does that take? I mean clearly it's not something you you can find out within a week, but you know, what are the implications of the time it takes to understand what happens? Yes, I mean it's this is this is causing a lot of sort of let's say headache for many people in terms of trying to study uh, the B617.2 variant and 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 whether it's it's more it's transmitting faster, it's growing faster, or is it is it something to be worried about compared to the B117, because of course the goalposts have been changing. We we got worried about B117 because it was 50% more transmissible than the original virus. Now we need to know whether this new virus is equally more transmissible or has some other properties that mean that we don't want it spreading in the population. So the first thing we should really do is, uh, is learn from other countries. And I think this is something that we still haven't done very well in the UK. And you know we, we, we want to try and measure everything in the UK, whereas actually you just need to do some proper measurements or, or just look at what's happening in other places. So in India, for example, uh, there's plenty of genomic data. Of course, it's sparse and the, the usual caveats that uh, in India, uh, the, the 617 had uh, started emerging. There was an earlier variant of it, which came first. Um, uh, but B117 was also introduced into India um, uh, at the end of last year. So there were, there were multiple different variants uh, present. And we found that the 617 seems to have overtaken these other uh, co-circulating or these other, these other viruses. And, and, and now if you look at the data being uploaded um, from, from India and, even, and Delhi, for example, you'll see that the, 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 last, the vast majority of those sequences are 
B617.2. So you can see from that population that there it does appear to be an advantage. Now, in India, there was obviously um, a relaxation of, uh, of social distancing that happened at the beginning of this year. There were lots of big uh, uh, gatherings and that's allowed this expansion to be observed in real time and fairly quickly because there's an opening up. Whereas in the UK, of course, the infections were seeded at a time when there were quite a lot of restrictions in place. And so we we've been observing these clusters forming, these you know, uh, infections from people arriving on a plane and, and potentially transmitting to people around them. Um, but the spread in the general population has been, is, is happening and it's obviously doubling quite rapidly, but it still has not been as large as it would have been had we been fully open. And, and that's been one of the arguments for saying, why are we opening up so early? Because you, you have this new variant that is seeding and if you release restrictions, it will explode like as we've seen in India. Does that? So, so that's that that that's so bringing that back to the sort of the, the some of the key questions that we're now all interested in. Christina started by talking about the relative increase um, um, of of this variant compared to B one one seven over time. It comes down to the question about the relationship between the spread of this particular variant, vaccination rates across the country, which of course mm. are increasing, but still maybe 50% of people not, or more not fully two dose vaccinated. Um, and you're doing laboratory work that tries to tease apart what the, you know, what immunity to vaccines will do in terms of preventing this particular variant. Can you summarize some of those um, findings that can help sort of guide us in, in, in our level of concern about this variant spreading within the UK? Uh, yes, uh, this is the big question, isn't it? So again, I'll go back to learning from other countries. You know, we should learn from India. They've had many, many deaths. There are anecdotal um, and substantiated reports of uh, people who have been vaccinated with AstraZeneca becoming, in, you know, being infected. And we, we've described an outbreak in a healthcare facility where 30, uh, 12 individuals were infected with a single uh, single uh, virus, uh, 617.2, even though they were fully vaccinated and they got it from probably one or two sources. So, so one single event led to 12 people becoming infected despite the vaccine. So that's not a sporadic sort of accident or, or, or probabilistic um, uh, uh, event. That tells you that, that that virus is able to infect people who have been vaccinated. Um, there are also many reports of people dying after you know, being vaccinated and, of course, um, uh, after they have had uh, um, the, the infection earlier in the year or the year before. So, so then, then you take that, those sorts of anecdotal reports that are not really sort of substantiated yet with big uh, population level studies. And then you come to the UK. We have a, a population that is largely vaccinated with one dose, as you say. Um, and we know from a number of studies um, uh, that a single dose, you know, gives you some uh, uh, level of neutralizing antibody, it gives you some T cell responses, but uh, they're, they're, fairly, um, they're fairly modest. And the second dose is the one that gives you the really, the really sort of high levels and, and the protective levels. And this, become, this is really important because uh, when these, these, these vaccines were de designed against what we call the Wuhan strain, as I said, the early version of the virus. Now these variants are some, uh, for example, the, the 617.2, um, we've shown in our lab and, and a number of other uh, groups have shown this, that, that it's somewhere between three and seven times less sensitive to neutralizing antibodies made by vaccination, let's say. So we call that modest because what we call, you know, it's not, prop it's not a full escape, which would be in excess of tenfold, you know, which is sort of the thing we see with the South African origin variant, the B1.351. So we, we're calling it a modest um, uh, level of change. Now, that can actually have quite significant effects if you imagine being protected from the infection. We know that the vaccines are protecting against severe disease, and that's really important to emphasize in this whole discussion, that vaccination is still the central um, goal for, for all countries, uh, uh, and it will protect against morbidity or mortality in the majority of individuals. However, if you imagine this virus, it's highly infectious. Um, it infects your, your, you know, through the nose, let's say, um, uh, or the back of the throat. So if, if you imagine receiving a dose of, of, of that virus and you are vaccinated, uh, you, you're depending on your an the antibodies uh, in the mucosal surface. In other words, the, the, the antibodies that are sitting in, your no in the lining of your nose to stop a virus. This virus is highly fusogenic as, as we and others are, are showing. 
and, and therefore is able to, to cause infection very, very quickly. Uh, so, so the probability of your, your, your antibodies stopping every particle is, is potentially not as high as um, one would expect. And that's probably why the two doses are important to, for full protection. You're on mute, Dina. Thanks, I thanks, Ravi. That's, that's that's very clear. I, I'm just aware. Um, I think Alice, that you, you want to take a couple of questions at two o'clock, but we can come back to this Q and A um, uh, late later on. Is that is that so? Is that Christina? Are you happy with that? Yeah. Okay. So thanks, Ravi. So far, that's been a really useful sort of background to to um, what we're all talking about. Uh, and I'll pass over to you, Alice. Thank you very much, Dean, and, and thank you, Ravi, um, for that discussion around variants. And now that we're armed with a little bit more knowledge, we will open up to um, questions. There was just one thing I wanted to ask you, though, Ravi. You mentioned. Uh, that um, viruses could become more fusogenic. What, what does that mean? What does, how does that oh. affect the behaviour of the virus? Yes, so um, it, it, it's a biological property of, of viruses such as um, SARS. They, they actually are bits of protein and what they have around them is a bit of cell membrane that they take from our cells when they, they, when they um, uh, leave a cell. Uh, so that they, they, they replicate or divide or make copies of themselves within our, the cells in our nose or our, or our lungs. And then when they leave the cell, they actually take a, take a piece of our cell membrane with them. And, and, that, and, and, and they use that to then um, uh, cause an infection in the next cell. Um, but what helps that is the fact that the viral spike protein that's sitting on the surface of the virus enables that, that, um, that joining of cell membranes to occur and therefore the, the virus particle to cause an infection. And what we've realized is that the B117 has a change in its spike protein and the Indian, uh, the Indian 617 variant also has a change that enable those viruses to more efficiently cause that, um, that uh, infection process. And that's independent of actually the typical, it's independent of the typical mutations we associate with, um, uh, with binding of the, of the virus to the ACE2 receptor, which is the receptor binding domain, which you may have heard of. So the mutations I'm talking about are additional ones that are seen in these new variants that, that uh, we believe may be uh, leading to increased um, uh, infectivity and increased transmission potentially. Thank you very much. It's just extraordinary to be able to, you know, look at the genetics of this evolving virus and, and work out what's happening um, and, and why these variants are, are becoming more effective at their job and more worrying for us. I'm going to start with some questions now. We have with us Charlotte Forsyth from Folkestone in Kent. Charlotte, are you with us? Can you ask your question? Good afternoon. Hello, Charlotte. Can you, I can't get my video working. I think it's turned off. Oh, can you we me? can hear you though, so go um, ahead. My question to the panel is, what is or would should be the trigger for surge testing to start? So, for example, I live just outside of Canterbury in Kent. The virus numbers have doubled in the last week and the variant is now 90% of cases. Locally, there are, within Canterbury, there are three universities and a college. So there's high potential for spreading and overspill into the community. Thank you very much, Charlotte. So, so what should the trigger be for surge testing? Who would like to take that first? I mean, is that something I can come straight back to you on, Ravi? Oh, I was going to mention Christina. So there we um, Christina, do you want to start then? And then maybe Ravi will come back to you. Well, I mean, so my, my view is that once, given the potential of this variant to have quite serious consequences according to the SAGE models, I think it's important that we try not to let it spread and surge testing is one of the things you can do to try and identify cases. I still think, and as we've said over and over again, that unless you, you give people the means to do something about a positive test, which is support for isolation, there's only so much surge testing can do. Um, and, and so I think it has to be part of a comprehensive local response, which, which you've seen and, and many local authorities are trying to do that. Um, but certainly, you know, given that cases have doubled in the last week and you know that the variant is dominant there, I would have expected there to be an intense local response, whether that's surge testing or targeted contact tracing or whatever it happens to be. 
Thank you very much, Christina. Ravi, would you like to add to that at all? Yes, I, I think that this variant is, a, you know, is one to worry about. We could we could see that from what's happening in India, uh, and and therefore, even before we really knew what what it was doing in the UK, surge testing is the safest thing to do. It's better to be wrong uh, and overcall it than 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 to let it spread. Because once um, once uh, trans generalized transmission has started, we know that the only way to really um, uh, prevent it is a, is then a, a, a big lockdown. So uh, so 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 I. I, I certainly agree with that example in Canterbury with uh, doubling of, uh, of cases and, and you very accounting for a large proportion and having a, 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 an unvaccinated population um, uh, is, is certainly a recipe for, 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 for gen generating more transmission. Thank you very much, Ravi. I see quite a few people wanting to um, answer this question, involve themselves in the discussion. Dr. Kit Yates, um, and then I'll come to Professor Gabriel Scally. Kit. I think one of the strange things about these enhanced measures that are being announced in, in regions where we're seeing large numbers of B1617.2 are things like enhanced contact tracing. So uh, going ahead and, and tracing people both forwards and backwards and getting contacts of people who are infected to, uh, to test as well. In most countries, that's just called contact tracing. That's what we should have been doing right from the start. That's what our fine test trace and isolate system should be doing all the time instead of making that enhanced. So in terms, of, in terms of the level where that should kick in, it should just kick in everywhere. That's what we should be doing. So it's strange to see it only happening in, in these places where there's a problem and maybe that problem's already out of control. Thanks, Kit. Um, Gabriel, over to you. Uh, thanks, Alice. Uh, a good question, Charlotte. I don't think there is a fixed uh, data point of which you suddenly uh, adopt special measures. It would be a, a progressive response to the growth in numbers, the speed of the growth in numbers, the baseline from which that growth has taken place. Uh, and it would be a judgment about the, the potential risk as well if it is a, a high risk community. We know that some, unfortunately, some places are at a much higher risk of having very accelerated spread. The, the factors of uh, a high level of deprivation, high level of overcrowded housing, a high proportion of people from BME communities, all those factors operate. So it depends on the nature of the, the, the data that you've got, uh, the, what the data is telling you, the nature of the community whose health you're trying to, uh, trying to protect, and then the options that you have. And, and Kit's quite right. Doing the fine test, trace, isolate support system properly is the first thing you should be doing. And we should all be doing that. And I find it astounding that uh, the so-called NHS test and uh, trace system isn't doing what uh, the international advice has been saying for so long, WHO and others, that we must test all of the people at high risk. I find it astounding we're not testing all of the close contacts immediately. That is ridiculous. Then other measures like uh, immunization programs, because we know there is a big variation in uptake of immunization uh, with, within different social groups and different characteristics. Uh, and there's plenty of room to improve immunization, uh, uh, extending the age range of immunization as well to cover all people uh, over the uh, 18 and over. There are a whole string of things. I think the, uh, doing surge testing, long queues, um, people uh, setting up special clinics and, and, and taking swabs uh, on the street uh, gives good TV coverage, but you do need to do all of the really basic stuff. And that's best led by the local directors of public health and provided by the local public health teams. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. And of course, a couple of weeks ago, we saw um, a couple of exceptional cases of uh, test and trace being done extremely well in Leicester and Newham, um, hearing from both of those cities about their about their local public health response to the, to the pandemic. Um, Dr. Zubeda Hack, I think you wanted to ask Ravi something. Something. Yes, yes, please. Um, so we're we're all banding around the term surge testing, but just to clarify, does surge testing still depend on people coming forward for the test? And is and I have to say I, I've heard this um, from a head teacher. Um, is is it? still surge testing if the um, test and trace team say to a school 
well, we'll wait for the parents to come to us with a positive test result before we go ahead. Um, I'm not sure I'm best placed to, to answer that because I'm not on the ground and, and, you know, I think the public health units would answer that best. But from what I can see, um, surge testing really should be um, offering tests in a systematic way to streets and postcodes, uh, either by letter, phone or even knocking on the door. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how it's done, but um, certainly if you're surge testing, schools must be included, I think. And I think that um, waiting for positive or symptomatic children to come forward is going to miss a lot of infections. Yes. Sorry, Alice, do you mind if I just follow up on that? Just a quick point, which is that... Yeah, go for it, and then I'm going to bring in Stephen and Tallulah. So, yes, do follow Thank up. Thank you. Well, well, it it just concerns me that we're still back to the same problem as my colleague Gabriel Scali and Christina and others have, have uh, and Kit have, have mentioned, which is it goes back to the same issue that unless we're going... Unless it's really clear to people that they have financial support and other accommodation and other support, especially in multi-generational and overcrowded housing, to self-isolate, it's still unclear to me why people would come forward for testing. So I know we're talking about surge testing and I know one in three people you know, are, are not symptomatic, but it still concerns me that we haven't addressed that gap. Thank you. Thank you, Zubeda. And uh, Professor Stephen Reicher, you wanted to come in on this. You don't anymore. Um, Dr. Talila Oni, I think I saw your hand up. No? OK, we'll move on to the next question then. Um, thank you very much, Charlotte, for that one. And the next question comes from Nicola Davis from The Guardian. Nicola, over to you. Thanks, Alice. And, and hi, everyone. Um, great to do this. I just have a, a couple of questions here, if I may. I'll try to keep them quite short. Um, one is that earlier this week, uh, some experts, including Neil Ferguson, were talking about a glimmer of hope that perhaps this variant isn't as transmissible as some of the uh, suggestions in the SAGE documents uh, kind of put the, put the estimates at. Um, and there have been suggestions by others that perhaps the transmissibility is more linked to demographic issues. So, for example, uh, cases being seeded in areas where you have high multi-generational, high levels of multi-generational housing and other uh, demographic or social issues that could be linked to spread rather than sort of inherent genetic uh, issues. So I wondered, um, you know, whether perhaps uh, Professor Gupta, you could tell me whether you think that from what you're seeing, that that might be explaining a large part of this gro high growth rate of this variant. Um, second part, I'll, I'll just sort of get them out there and then you can sort of, you might want to answer them as we go. Uh, yesterday, Public Health England said that there's a new variant under investigation. Um, some scientists have pushed back and said, you know, we shouldn't get worried every time there's a new variant under investigation. Obviously, from the media point of view, we feel that we have a responsibility to report what's happening. Be interested to hear what you have to say about that. Um, and very last one is some people have said it's a question about the transmissibility, because clearly this variant was present in India before there was the kind of devastating situation that's now been seen. So does that raise questions at all about why perhaps it didn't take off sooner there? Sorry, a bit of a deluge, but hopefully they kind of all are related. So I'm hoping that might help. Yeah, so really thank important. You oh, thank you. Thank you, Nicola. That's all right. Ravi, over to you. No, really important questions. I mean, um, you're right that the 617 was uh, isolated uh, or detected some months back in India. And I still remember that sort of double mutant sort of uh, headline in the press uh, that kind of came and went. Um, you know, the scientists had flagged it up at the time, but, you know, this virus takes time to grow in communities. I'm not sure whether I can explain it. it, is, it is, I guess it is to do with exponential growth about contact networks, etc. But, but, you know, the expansion did happen and there was a delay in it happening relative to, you know, the opening up of, of society and all the, the mass gatherings. So I think we're going to see the same thing in the UK, that, that there is a small it's a small beginning. I think that these large uh, initial clusters, as you say, are related to, um, uh, they may be demographically related, they may be due to, you know, seeding in particular types of uh, individuals or, or communities, but there will be, there is already community spread and it is going to exponentially rise. There is no doubt. We still have, um, you know, people under, under the age of 30 not vaccinated. We have many people with only one dose. So this virus has plenty of space to expand exponentially and, and reach very high levels of infection with quite high levels of, of morbidity overall, because there may be small percentages, 
uh, give, because you're young or you know you're partially vaccinated. But there, you know there, there will be some fallout from this. Thank you, Ravi. I mean, another really interesting part of uh, Nicola's question was it was about communication, about kind of public engagement around uh, the emergence of uh, of new variants. Do you, do you think it's about right at the moment? The the I suppose I suppose the visibility mm -hmm. um, to the public of, of these variants being picked up. Do you think it do you think it causes undue worry or anxiety, or do you think perhaps on the other hand it might actually lead to people? Um, thinking that actually maybe there's there's not as big a problem because they keep popping up all the time. How, how do you feel about that communication side of it? Well, I mean, there's the communication, but there's also as a scientist, I'm also sort of now switching off sometimes when I hear about a new VUI because, you know, you, there's, there are some mutations in there and, you know, you think, okay, well, this is happening globally. Uh, we have plenty of viruses with those same mutations already around that have been circulating at low levels, some of them going up and down. So, I think that one needs to keep an eye on them because you, you're looking for growth of those virus lineages. Um, and the, but I'm not sure that people need to know, uh, certainly the public, and, and, until there is, there, is, um, there is a reason to. And I think that public health uh, uh, plus the scientists uh, involved should be the ones who you know, process that, those data. Um, and I think that's what will happen over time. But of course, in the 617 scenario, it's totally different. Of course, you had a raging epidemic in another place. And when when we first detected it here, there was reason to be worried because you know that's a virus that has caused devastation already, uh, and and uh, one would not wait for uh, for exponential growth in this country before acting or, or raising the alarm. Thank you, Ravi. Professor Susan Mickey, you want to comment? It's just on the communication side of things. I think what's really important is to have a consistent, coherent narrative that's given to all of us so people can understand exactly the issues um, that we're discussing right now. And one of the problems all the way along really has been mixed messages. You know, there's confusion as to, are we allowed to go to um, orange amber countries or not? You know, there's confusion about why on the one hand this is said, something else is said. So I think what's really important is just to have a very clear explanation of what the situation is, which can include uncertainty. And um, people can understand that. And I think what is really important is to get away from these kind of mixed messages that aren't part of a coherent whole. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Professor Christina Pargel, and then I'll come to you, Zubeda. Just, just on the thing about early detection, I mean, B117, say the Kent variant was first detected in a sample from September and it didn't really take off for several months and then it took off very, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the, the very early stages of a new variant where it's in maybe just a handful of people, it can kind of come and go, come and go. And then it takes a while for it to kind of establish itself and then really start having exponential growth. Um, and especially when you're at small numbers, you don't notice it for a long time in overall numbers. And we're still, you know, as I tried to say today, you can you can have it growing exponentially quite rapidly and it's still not affecting your overall numbers if the main dominant variants are flat or falling um and i think that does lead to a bit of complacency and it's a bit kind of like professor gibbs said like if you want to stamp it out you have to act now or preferably a few weeks ago <laughs> from my opinion you know when when you have small numbers because once it is widespread you can't um then it's really hard to go back really, really hard. And, and we, I mean, we didn't manage it with the Kent variant. You know, we, we did let it spread. It did come dominant here and then across the rest of the world. And that, and then you kind of see what that's led to. So that I think is the worry for me that, that if you wait until it's, it's bond or obvious that it's a problem, then, then you've waited too long. Thank you, Christina and Dr. Zubeda Hack. I think my concern right now is that the government, Matt Hancock, Boris Johnson, but particularly Matt Hancock this week, have spent more time playing politics with the B1617.2 so-called mm -hmm. Indian variant than actually explaining what's going on. So at the beginning of the week, we had Matt Hancock suggesting that it was really the fault of the 18 people who were severely ill in a hospital in Bolton because to 12 to up to 12 of those patients had declined the vaccine now how he knows that i don't know but the point is is we don't know why they declined the vaccine and more to the point six of those people in hospital 
had taken the vaccine, either one or two doses. And of course, we also had Matt Hancock at one point during the week suggesting that, you know, this may be, um, he was sort of linking it to vaccine hesitancy. I had presenters on radio shows asking me, is this an Indian issue, an issue among the Indian population in the UK, issues around multi-generational household, households and so on. And it was all about finger pointing and blaming and scapegoating. It wasn't mixed messages. It was deliberately trying to blame the spread of this variant, this new variant, on particular communities, particular groups um, and, and the public. And I think we need to, we really need to push back on that. That's not mixed messaging. That's playing politics. Thank you very much, Zubeda. And I, I thought that the data was really clear from Christina's presentation as well, that we're, we're not looking at a community which is under vaccinated compared with everybody else. Um, Professor Anthony Costello, I know that you wanted to comment too. Yeah, just on the glimmer of hope, obviously the biggest difference now is that 70% of our adult population are vaccinated and that should slow the spread wherever it springs up. But to snuff it out, you need, as we've heard, a proper fine test trace isolate system that we don't have. And when we heard from Newham and Leicester who are desperately trying to pull one together, they didn't receive any money from the NHS test and trace, which is actually an outsource thing to private companies who then outsource again to a whole umbrella of small companies, many of them with foreign directors in order to avoid paying tax. That's the system we have in place and it's just not fit for purpose. And a lot of data is not being shared from that system back into the primary care. So that's, that's the bad thing. If we had a proper fine test, I'd be very optimistic about uh, with our vaccination going up. But as for the Indian variant, so-called, I was on a call with a lot of uh, very experienced Indian physicians in Delhi yesterday, and many of them actually on the call had been hospitalized, even though they had been fully vaccinated. They didn't die, but the figures from, there have been 244 doctors who have died in Delhi during the latest surge, and 3% of them were fully vaccinated. Now that's much lower than those that weren't, but nonetheless, uh, you know, this is a serious virus and that's why we should be suppressing it. And the failure of the government to set up fine test, trace and isolate for ideological reasons, I think is, is damning. Thank you very much, Anthony. And uh, Stephen, you want to comment too? I, I apologise for this in advance because this is probably blasphemy. But um, I have some sympathy for the government uh, in this situation because what we're faced with is uncertainty. We don't know. We know this new variant might be very serious. We don't know how serious. We don't know how much more it transmits. We don't know if it has vaccine escape. So we're doing um, decision-making in a situation of uncertainty. And that's always a dilemma. And it's not about the science so much about how you weight and value the different outcomes. Now, the prime minister has been very clear. He said, we wait until we're absolutely certain this is dangerous before doing anything. Okay? We need that certainty to know how to act. But to explain why that's problematic, let me use an analogy. Imagine you're desperate to get home. You're going home, you're walking through the woods, and you see an animal in the distance. And you're not sure whether it's a wolf or a dog. Do you keep going or don't you keep going? <laughs> well, you might say, I really want to get home. It's desperate for me to get home. So I'll carry on going and carry on going until I know it's a wolf. But by the time you see it's a wolf, it's too late and the wolf jumps on you and gobbles you up. And that's, in a sense, the situation we're in at the moment. We have uncertainty. So let's look at the relative costs. And what are the costs of waiting and waiting and waiting? Well, we might be wasting our time uh, in taking measures or at least not releasing measures because it might turn out not to be dangerous. But on the other hand, if it does turn out to be dangerous, as Christina says, it might be too late, it might be seeded, we might have to move backwards, we might have to go into real lockdown. So I think we have to acknowledge that there is no simple or absolute answer, there's no simple right or wrong, it's a weighting of alternatives. But it seems to me, I think it mean, uh, uh, seems to us, that it's more sensible to be cautious because the costs of being wrong about it being safe are far greater than the alternative. And that's why we be, should be taking more measures now. Thank you very much indeed, Stephen. I'm going to move on to another question now, which um, comes from 
Riaz Richards, who flew into the UK from Dubai via Cairo earlier this week and is joining us from a quarantine hotel in central London. Riaz. Afternoon, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, my question is about the, the difference. The red, do you believe that the red list quarantine versus the amber list quarantine is actually making the country safer? And is, or is there any evidence of that? Because my experience since landing to where I'm sitting now is that it makes no difference whether I isolating in this private hotel, which I've paid a fortune for, or if I'd uh, gone home or to a family's house and done the same 10 days there. Um, you know, is it is it actually making a, a difference between the red list countries and the amber list countries? I shared a play. I went from I came from Dubai, which is I can tell you now felt a lot safer than when I landed in Cairo at the airport, where it seemed like it was life as normal, and then landed in London. And there were so many holes in the procedure from the time I got through border control to getting onto a bus, where normal people I say normal people, normal passengers going to share a lift with me were next to me when I got my baggage. So, I, you know, it, I was so happy when my test came back negative today. So my question really is, is, it, is there actually a difference between this hotel quarantine that's required for amb- red list countries, sorry, and, you know, compared to uh, the amber list? And, and is there evidence for that? Because, you know, from where I'm sitting, it's, it doesn't seem to make any difference. Thank you very much, Riaz, and very glad to hear that your first test has come back negative. Um, who would like to start with this then? Is is there really a difference between red and amber in terms of um, the, the the outcomes if people are bringing COVID into the country? Not that I'm saying Riaz is, but if people are. Who would like to start with that? Kit. I think there's a lot, a lot to consider. One of the questions is whether the red list is really an effective way of keeping new variants out of the country. Should we not be doing managed isolation for everyone that comes back in the country um, with possible potential exceptions for people who might find it difficult for mental health reasons. Um, I think there is a big difference between isolating in a hotel and isolating at home. I'd be interested to hear your experience, Riaz, as to how closely you're being monitored in the hotel and, and whether people would know if you left the hotel. I suspect they might, but certainly at home quarantine is not practically enforceable for the numbers of travelers that we have coming into the UK at the moment. At the moment, the system is you get a phone call uh, maybe once, maybe twice during your quarantine to to check uh, and not everyone gets this phone call and you, there's no way of them actually checking you are where you say you are. Uh, so I think there is a big difference between hope managed isolation in the hotel. Unfortunately, it is much more expensive for the traveller versus at home uh, quarantining. And we've seen that the countries that have successfully kept COVID out of their borders, places like Australia and New Zealand have implemented these strict managed uh, hotel isolation and that is the the best way to try and keep new variants out of the country. Thank you very much Kit. Um, Professor Martin McKee then I'll come to you Stephen. No I I agree with you there there is a clearly a difference between them because also if you're isolating at home hopefully you really are isolating at home but you are likely to come into contact with other people and spread it to them. Now we also have to recognise that in Australia there have been cases of transmission within the isolation hospitals with people going from with the air going from room to room. So we do need to look at that. I think there's a really important message about trying to make sure that the place that you are isolating in is as agreeable as possible and that you are provided with facilities that that actually allow you to, to be made comfortable. But I think there is a real difficulty here with the whole concept because it's based on an extremely simplistic model of international travel, which you have actually highlighted. The reality of it is that very few people Uh, relatively few people are just going from A to B, from one country to another, where, to take the example of going to Portugal, where they're going from the UK going to Portugal, and in Portugal they're only mixing with Portuguese people, as opposed to people from other countries which might have a much higher incidence, or it ignores the fact that many of them do transit through other airports, as you said, in in Cairo. Um, And then, of course, you've got a list of 12 countries in the green list, many of which you can't actually get to, like South Georgia and so on, and you're just mystified as to how they got there. Why not some of the Pacific Islands, which also have very low um, 
cases which are also equally inaccessible for most people so it's difficult to to try and understand what the rationale behind all of it is but i think the point i would agree with kit that managed isolation but managed isolation that is meant that is designed to be as supportive as possible and and to make it as easy as possible which is the same principle for isolation everywhere that we've always said it should be as easy as possible to do the right thing Thank you very much, Martin. And coming to you now, Stephen, and then Dr. Tallulah Oni. Stephen. Well, it's a very good question. And we're actually developing um, a paper on this, which hopefully will be out next week. So next week, you'll be able to read it in, uh, in detail. Um, so I won't uh, rehearse the arguments as to why the traffic light system really doesn't make sense. I mean, it is, in effect, an, an institutionalized system for closing the stable door after the horse is bolted. It really doesn't make sense. But I just want to make a, a, a couple of points, uh, which I don't think have been stressed enough. I mean, the first is that the accommodation has got to be of a decent quality. People have got to be properly supported. They've got to be properly supported emotionally, people checking up that they're okay. They've got to be given decent food and they've got to be given decent conditions. If you look internationally, if you look at Singapore, if you look at New Zealand and you look at the hotels uh, in which people are isolated, they're really nice hotels. In this country, it's not the same. So the first thing is the standards need to be decent. The second is the issue of inequalities. There are people who need to go uh, and perhaps see family where there's a, where there's a, a funeral, uh, tragically, perhaps a wedding. Um, and for them, the cost of isolation when they come home or the cost of people coming into the country to visit family for a, we a wedding or funeral is prohibitive. As you say, it's incredibly expensive. So we ought to be giving financial support to people who need it in this system so it does become an equal system. And the final thing is, I, I, of course, it is easier to monitor um, isolation in a hotel, in, in a specific center rather than the home. However, another issue which we don't talk about enough is mental health. And there are, in the same way that there are some people who can't wear masks, there are some people for whom being enclosed in a rather regimented system would be well, it would be worse than being in prison. They wouldn't be able to cope with it. And so we should be open to people with uh, mental health conditions having the option uh, to self isolate at home. It should be properly monitored. Again, they should be checked up on. There's more to support them than to than for surveillance, but we should have that option as well. So I think the problem is that the uh, system has been ill thought out at every single level. The traffic lights don't make sense. The conditions are appalling. We're not giving proper support and we're not dealing with issues of mental health. So we need a decent system and we haven't got it. Thank you very much, Stephen. And uh, Dr. Tallulah Oni, you wanted to comment. Thanks. I, I support all the um, inputs so far, I'd like to have a, a slightly different conversation. So recognizing the um, that some people will need to travel, um, just going back to the green amber, um, the red amber conversation, some people will need to travel, emergencies, family, et cetera, related to Steve's point about mental health. But we, as a collective, more broadly population across the population, we do have to remember that we are in the middle of a pandemic. So the communication and the um, with the with the communities and the general population is really critical. I just spoke to um, a, a colleague in in Nepal who is a health professional, young, that's just come out of being in a hospital for ten days. I mean, the, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and so. I do think it really is important that we continue to contextualize that. Um, the reality is that the majority of the world um, is going through um, increasing cases with uh, limited access to or no access to vac vaccinations and vaccines. Um, and it's just, I don't know, I just find, I find a little bit distasteful, to be honest, the conversations about when can we go on holiday? I just, you know, th those bits just, you know, we remember, if you remember December when we when we were in the middle of a Christmas and we thought, oh, if only I could see my gran and hug my gran. And I, we can do that now. Let's remember the basic things that we couldn't do that we realized were really critical. Going on holiday, I'm sorry, is just simply not one of those in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and so I really think in the thinking about um, 
And it's not just global either, because even within this country, this kind of conversation amplifies the inequities because we know that when we, if we have increased spikes in a third and a third, um, another wave, Again, it doesn't impact everyone in this country equally. So some people can afford, it's like, oh, is it that big a deal if we then have another shutdown, I just work at home. That's not the case for most people. So I just want to have a different conversation of, the, of just reminding us that we are in the middle of a pandemic and that we all have to get through this together and that that involves some sacrifices and least, of, least painful of those, I would think, are whether or not we can go on holiday abroad. Thank you very much to Lula and um, thank you for that question as well. Um, moving on now um, and hope it all goes well with your quarantine, Riaz. Moving on now to your question from Kevin McLaughlin. Kevin, are you with us? Uh, yes, good afternoon and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my question is whether there is any concern that a strategy of mass vaccination during a pandemic can select for immune escape variants that are more infectious. Uh, when we look at the situation in countries, for example, like the Maldives, Bahrain and Chile, we see that the vaccination rates uh, in excess of 50%, yet we see now rising case numbers. Uh, my question, I am referring, of course, to uh, theories espoused by Dr. Gert van den Bosch, and I would add that I am not a proponent of his theories. I've received my first dose of the vaccine, but I would appreciate any comments from the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. So this is a question about vaccine escape and new variants, and are we are we are we putting in place the selection pressure to actually select for uh, vaccine escapees? Ravi, could I hand that to you to start with? You're muted at the moment, Ravi. Sorry, so I sneezed earlier, so I didn't think you wanted to hear that. So, um, I mean, look, the, the, yes, there is that. That is a a potential risk, but of course, there's no other way out of, of, of this pandemic and more people, lots of people are going to die unless we do something. So vaccination is pretty much the only thing we have. Um, if done effectively, you shut down transmission and you shut down evolution, essentially, because there's no infection to start with. So that's why vaccination essentially will, if done, if done, you know, in an ideal sense, would 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 uh, close that door. Um, of course, vaccination is sporadic and it's in, it, there's inequality. And the virus is still transmitting uh, and, and therefore there is a, a risk that viruses will um, overcome or, or, or evolve to, to, to kind of overcome vaccines. But then again, vaccines are only really mimicking what the human body does. So, uh, you know, the, the virus would have anyway been, been, uh, been, been, been uh, selecting for mutations that, that overcome immunity. And we can see that's already happening. It happened before vaccines were even available. So I certainly will not be I do not support any views that vaccines are going to drive some kind of calamity. They are the only way we're going to get on top of this. And uh, good research on predicting the effect of vaccines against new variants, surveillance for new variants and, and designing vaccine strategies uh, that can cover broad uh, groups of mutations uh, are essential. We've, we've had a lot of experience with HIV where we unfortunately failed to get a vaccine, but there are a lot of um, uh, things that science has learned through studying other infections uh, that will help us uh, to achieve this. Thank you very much, Ravi and uh, Professor Dean and Pillay. Yeah, and and thanks. And and um, it, it isn't. It, it's a potent, It's an interesting question. But I mean, I I, I fully support what Ravi um, has has said. And the, the important point is that, of course, natural infection itself, you know, is a, is is a natural immunity is of course also a major driver of 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 of, of, of evolution, but nevertheless, uh, vaccination, uh, you know, has worked so widely with so many infections that um, clearly this is the way to go. But I, I'd like to sort of also come back and ask Ravi, um, you know, about your thoughts um, along these lines of, you know, of this uh, this this trade off between increasing vaccination rates across the in in the UK fortunately we 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 we're, we're witnessing this versus the transmission of new variants and we've talked about both of those things but you know presumably given that vaccines 
I'm sure we'll all agree and you'd agree that will have some impact in reducing the tra in reducing infection rates and 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 reducing the infectivity of those infected despite vaccines mm -hmm. then where do you see the future going in the context of both increasing vaccination perhaps having a third dose of vaccine or you know to deal with waning immunity or maybe vaccines that, that cover new variants versus the continual evolution and and importation of course of other variants so where do you see that balance and how hopeful uh, mm -hmm. or, or depressed are you about the future mm -hmm. of control of covid Yes, these are these are questions uh, that uh, have no answers at the moment, and and we really need answers because we need to plan. You know, that's the key thing. We 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 do, and this is where learning from other diseases and experts' opinion become important. Um, I think uh, we can see already that some vaccines may have a little bit greater protection because they achieve higher levels of antibodies in a certain period, and that starts telling us that that antibody levels are really important, um, especially when new variants emerge that have some, you know, an element of avoidance of immunity. Yeah, having very high levels of something means that you're going to block pretty much everything. But remember, of course, as you say, people's immunity is going to wane. We need to, first of all, to get some good data on decline of responses. We and others have got cohorts of vaccinated individuals, and we're going to be watching that very closely. Um, Boosting is going to be inevitable, uh, of course, but the question then is what, what do you boost with? Uh, you know, is the usual vaccine? Pfizer just made the announcement that they did not need to change their vaccine for the moment. Um, you know, I think they're se essentially saying just buy more of our vaccine and re-vaccinate re everybody to get to, to increase the levels, which is okay for some. Uh, Moderna produced a, 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 a B1.351 version of their vaccine and a multivalent vaccine, I think. So they are covering the base of, you know, let's let's try and uh, expand the coverage um, of, of strains or variants that we can cover. Um, and I think we'll just have to try each of these different things in different places. I think we're still in the experimental phase. We, we still have to learn these things, you know, learn about how to best deal with this. We are unlikely to get it right first time, but I think we need to um, be creative in, in exploring all the relevant options, you know, up front. Uh, so doing the studies on third dosing, doing the studies on different vaccines. Of course, you need some transmission, uh, which global the global situation has given us a natural way of testing things. And it's a sad thing, but also it will have some positive impact if we get the right studies in place at the right time. Uh, and in terms of driving vaccine escape, uh, yes, um, it will be a cat and mouse game for, for the way I see it right now. And it is going to be cat and mouse where we try and keep track with the virus, change our vaccines, the virus changes. It's essentially like flu, um, although it's unclear as to whether how this will play out longer term, I think. Thank you so much for that, Ravi. And I know that um, Professor Cole Friston, you wanted to say something here as well. well in fact, I, I just wanted to take the opportunity to, to ask Ravi a question, if I can use my time to do that. <laughs> and it's actually pressing you further on Deenan's question, to a certain extent, going back to um, Nicola's question about <clears throat> reasons to be frightened and reasons to be cheerful over the next few months, if, if not a year. Um, so last week we were sort of noting that a lot of people might be worried that we're in the same situ situation that we were in, say, last November, you know, with the Kent variant um, and an explosion, explosive growth of, of the Kent variant. But as, An as Anthony has pointed out, there is a, you know, a, a big difference in terms of the fact that the susceptible population is now much lower, in part due to vaccination. Mm -hmm. When you come to model this, there's another factor which um, has an extremely profound effect on the timing of any subsequent surge, and that's seasonality. So, mm -hmm. you know, you know, in November, things were getting worse in terms of humidity and temperature and all the other uh, factors that attend that, those climatic and seasonal variations. Now things are getting better month by month. So my question to you is, you know, is it possible to sort of look at the, sort of the lab data and the epidemiological data to disentangle what can be is the best explanation for an increase in transmissibility and transmission risk in terms of you know, the viral characteristics and the viral mutations versus the seasonal context in which those mutations are occurring? Mm. 
I think it's a really important question. Seasonality is something that um, has been looked at by various groups. I mean, there are data suggesting that latitude has, has an impact, uh, a certainly study in China that's suggesting that. Um, I'm not sure about the seasonality. I mean, yeah, I, of course, the, the behavioral changes are potentially contributing to um, seasonal declines in, 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 in SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I think there is still more to be learned in that regard. Is it due to mucosal immunity changing over that time? Is it due to the way we behave and come close together? Um, is it due to sunlight? You know, I mean, there could be so many different explanations uh, that, uh, in terms of what contributes to, uh, to, to transmission. Um, I think that uh, uh, in, in terms of the, the viral characteristics, um, we can see that the viruses are adapting to their environment. We're pushing them harder through our um, immunity and vaccines, and they are responding by not only uh, avoiding antibodies, but they're making themselves fitter. They are making them, the viruses are making themselves stronger um, through these mutations that we're seeing in the cleavage sites and other, other places. And we can see that in vitro, certainly. Uh, the B117 and the B617 both have, you know, enhanced replication characteristics. And this is to be expected, but it will, it obviously changes the way that the viruses behave, you know, in, in terms of their interaction with seasons, for example. Um, and given that we're, many of us are vaccinated or have been infected, these, uh, this, you're going to see this growth being very much slower than, than it would be normally. And I think that's, you know, so we, in my prediction is going to be that Think if things don't uh, change policy-wise, we will in September when schools go back. That's when we're going to see the really big, uh, the big wave. Because over, luckily we're coming into summer holidays, and I think the contacts between young people will probably fall. People will be outdoors. But my my real worry is about what's happening in September, and, and that's not so far away now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ravi. Does anybody else want to comment on that? We're almost at the end of our time for today. Uh, Professor Gabriel Scali, I'll let you have a last word. Uh, thank you. I, uh, I, I'm not a virologist, I'm a public health physician, but what I do know uh, is that the virus will only mutate as it replicates. So the best way of stopping mutation is stopping replication, and the best way of stopping that is driving down numbers. And vaccination is a powerful way of doing it, but like most vaccination programs, uh, they only work with a range of other measures and they only work if they're done well. And what we do know about running vaccination programs in, uh, in our communities is that there will be differential uptake of the vaccination unless we try very, very hard. And that requires people to try hard at a local level, general practitioners and the local public health teams again, and health visitors and all the other people who are involved in that effort at a local level. And I am, extremely worried by some of the figures that emerged from ONS about uptake of the vaccine, uh, vaccination levels in different uh, uh, social groups. For example, that in over 50s, um, people who live in their own home uh, that they, and own their own home have an uptake of, of, of 94%, but the vaccine ra vaccination rate amongst people in privately rented accommodation is 84%. Uh, amongst people who are in higher managerial or professional positions, the vaccination rate is 94%. Amongst people who have never worked or are unemployed is 81%. Mm -hmm. Now, those uh, inequalities are not acceptable either as a mean, either in the context of trying to keep the, uh, the virus under control, nor are they socially just. And it, it gives a lie to what the Secretary of State was pointing at the other day, pointing a finger at individuals. These are not the results of individual uh, decisions. These are the result of social characteristics that our structure of society has to learn better how to deal with. Uh, so there's a job to be done and we can stop viral mutation and we can stop uh, illness from the virus by stopping the virus. And that's what we should be concentrating on. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Well, I'll have to wrap things up for today. Um, but before we close completely, I'd like to ask Sir David King to say a few words. Sir David. Thank you very much, Alice. Uh, I think what I want to do, first of all, is, is thank uh, Ravi for his uh, contributions today. Ravi Gupta has really added enormous value to our understanding. So thank you very much. You. Um, and, and in particular, the understanding that you have 
of uh, the role of vaccination in holding back or not the the new uh, virus, the B1716.2. I think that this is a matter of concern to everybody in the country, and I think we've just had a very, very important discussion on that. But also the question of uh, development of new vaccines that might give us a more broad uh, defense against the these various mutations. Um, one of the issues that we need to discuss, I think, following the presentations today, um, particularly in terms of the, the number of children going down with this new variant, is shouldn't we be discussing extending vaccination to children as is happening in the united states and i i think we we really need to look at how we protect all aspects of our community and if there is no worry about children because they're unlikely to be very severely ill as a result of this i would just respond by saying the density of this virus determines its success in mutating and what we need to do is aim to get this virus out of out of our systems completely. But of course, and I leave you with this, it means internationally. And what is the big effort being made that ought to be made to see that the entire world gets vaccinated and gets vaccinated quickly? I have to always mention, and it has been mentioned once, the failure that is amazing us all in not setting up a fully functional fine test trace isolate and support system really we have this new virus we have a new disease in effect spreading in the country it's growing exponentially i loved the explanation that we heard so clear from christina that this flatlining of the number of cases per day is because of the rise in the in the new variant cases so that exponential growth needs to be got on top of quickly and that means surely separating people out from the rest of the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir David. Thank you to all of the independent SAGE scientists who work tirelessly to help the public navigate the pandemic. Thank you as well to our special guest today, Professor Ravi Gupta. All of Independent Sage's reports with expert analysis and advice are available on the website, along with details of all the scientists on this fantastic multidisciplinary team whose expertise ranges across virology, public health, behavioural psychology and ethnicity and equality. Thank you for your questions today and thank you for watching the briefing. Do follow Independent Sage on Twitter and Instagram if you don't already. We'll be back same time, same place. Stay safe. Keep well. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye.